I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Katrina Avila Municello. Katrina is a freelance writer, editor, blogger, and author whose work has appeared in publications including Yankee Magazine, Boston Globe Sunday Magazine, and Fresh Cup Magazine. The title of today's talk is The Rituals of Tea, Bostonians Yesterday and Today. I'd like to start with something I read recently which seemed particularly apropos for today. When tea becomes ritual, it takes its place at the heart of our ability to see greatness in the small things. In many ways, that is what tea has always been about, the small things. Some of you know the story, the original story from China about tea. The Chinese emperor Shen Nung, who is now considered the father of Chinese agriculture, sat for a peaceful afternoon in his garden relaxing, enjoying nature. He boiled some water to have a beverage and some tea leaves drifted down from a Camellia sinensis plant and landed in his cup. The leaves released their essence, adding flavor and a delicate scent. And that first sip, that warmth, that aroma, that taste refreshed and invigorated him, creating the very first tea moment and beginning a movement that would spread across the entire world. Now, whether that story is true or not, and I think it's likely not exactly how it happened, the story persists as it captures the joy and simplicity of what we love about tea. My name is Katrina Avila Minicello, and I'm a writer and editor who specializes in tea. It is very refreshing to be in a place that I do not need to spend the next 10 minutes saying, yes, tea, the thing you drink, T-E-A, tea, yes, I write about tea. So thank you for that. So how does someone get to this as a job? Like all great endeavors, it might have been an accident. I did not grow up with tea except for having an Anglophile grandmother who loved bone china and everything about the idea of having proper tea. I remember the year she decided to grow watercress on her windowsill to make sure we could have watercress sandwiches for afternoon lunch. However, she also used to use dry and reuse paper filter tea bags until they were in shreds on the dining room table. So I can't say as a kid that tea was a particularly attractive option then. I actually found tea after completing my biology degree at Tufts University, and I wandered into a tea shop many of you might know. Harvard Square um, Tea Lux had just opened, and I walked in the door and saw 80 teas on the menu. Now, the side of me that loves science was fascinated by the fact that there could be so many types of tea for one plant. The anthropologist in me was excited by the idea that so many different cultures could con consume the same thing, and the foodie in me was anxious to try them all. After my first two children were born and had left my work in nonprofit administration, I started blogging about tea to share all the information I was collecting. I had collected a lot of information about tea. My husband used to call me Tea's Cliff Clavin. Um, his suggestion that I start a blog about tea may have been a defensive strategy to give me someone else to talk about tea with. So I made contact with an editor and I started freelance writing for the tea industry. Later he hired me to be his senior editor for a magazine that was relaunching on a national scale. And I did some copywriting work for some tea companies and then I started working on the book. The book is really what brings me here today. One of the things I love most about tea is its stories. I like to hear the ways that people consume it, where they experience it, the moments they share with it, and how they're changed by it. I spent months collecting stories from all over the world, from tea drinkers, and it was here that the idea of ritual really stuck with me. There is a section of my book called Ceremony and Tradition, which could have very accurately been named Tea Ritual. It reads like this. The words tea and ceremony are frequently intertwined. When they come together, images of tatami mats, kimonos, delicate bamboo whisks, and small cups of matcha come to mind. 
The Japanese tea ceremony is strikingly beautiful and peaceful experience. It combines a reverence for art with nature, tea and mindfulness with elegance and grace. The experience, also called Chano Yu, is not, however, the only tea ceremony. There is an equally lovely Korean tea ceremony, as well as Chinese gong fu and English afternoon tea. In as many countries as tea is consumed, there are ceremonies and traditions that have taken root. Within these countries and regions, household traditions have been established. And in a world where so much changes and feels out of our control, we cling to our traditions. We seek to perfect them, to experience them more fully, and to hand them down to future generations. It is our way of ensuring the unbroken link between the parents of our parents' parents and the children of our children's children. Tea can be that link. But what of Boston and its rituals and traditions? It would be impossible to take a US history course and not know about Boston's intricate ties with tea. Bostonians were tea drinkers more than a century before that fateful day. Tea was being advertised for sale in 1690 by Benjamin Harris and Daniel Vernon. By 1712, Boston apothecary Zabdiel Boylston was licensed to import green and ordinary teas. In 1715, it made its way into coffee houses. It was first seen as medicine, a safe, non-alcoholic drink, since unboiled water was not particularly healthy to consume. Given the condition that most of the tea must have been in by the time it reached the shores, it was toted on people's backs for hundreds of miles across China, and then spent months on board a ship. And then the practice was to take the green tea and steep it in boiling water for 10 to 15 minutes. It very likely did have a medicinal quality, and it was prepared as a remedy for many ailments. After that, it evolved as a social drink, one that was consumed for enjoyment. Going out to tea was common practice, and when women went out to tea parties, they were always prepared. The ritual involved using their own teaware, pieces that they brought from home. The women would pack their teacups and their spoons in their bags and tote them to the house of the person they were visiting. In 1740, Joseph Bennett wrote about Boston. The ladies here visit, drink tea, and indulge in every little piece of gentility to the height and mode and neglect the affairs of their family with as good grace as the finest ladies in London. The types of tea we are used has a big impact on tea taking traditions and the rituals that emerge. When we picture tea drinking Bostonians of previous eras, eras we likely picture the teacups that most of us are familiar with. Actually though tea bowls were the style in the early 18th century rather than cups with handles. And as teaware changed throughout time, it even affected whether people traditionally sat to drink their tea or stood up. For a period, tea was sometimes drunk from saucers, poured from the cup onto these small plates as a way to cool the tea. But as often happens, the once common became passe, and soon it was considered less refined to sip from the saucer. The ritual changed to include sipping daintily from their teacups. In a letter written by Louisa May Alcott in 1860, she tells of a post-wedding tea that occurred at her house in which the controversial historical figure Captain John Brown's wife was visiting her home. Alcott wrote, Mrs. Brown is a tall, stout woman, plain, but with a strong good face and a natural dignity that showed she was something better than a lady, though she did drink out of her saucer and used the plainest speech. Knowing the local tea rituals was really important to avoid embarrassment and discomfort, as Mrs. Brown clearly had not yet learned. Another custom was important for those who wished to politely refuse a cup of tea, as a gracious hostess would serve tea as long as someone wanted another cup. When someone no longer wanted to be served tea, they were to turn their cup upside down and rest their spoon gently on top. One poor visitor to Boston recounted being served 12 cups of tea before someone finally let him in on the secret. In Boston, since teaware was such an important part of our tea experience, having it on display was common in many households. 
tilt-top tables like this one that's on display at the Peabody Essex Museum would have been very common to find. They were, tea ware was kept out to be admired and appreciated. In this way, tea was emphasized throughout the entire day, even when it wasn't being consumed. It's not surprising since by 1771, it was estimated that 340 pounds of tea was being drunk in Boston every day. With a full century of tea drinking in the colonies before the revolution, it was an important part of our culture. It was therefore no small thing for colonists to give up their tea. It was important symbolically and seen as a tremendous sacrifice. In 1773, the women of Boston signed a pledge stating, we the daughters of those patriots who have and do now appear for the public interest, and in that principally regard their posterity as such do with pleasure engage in the, with them in denying ourselves the pleasure of drinking foreign tea in hopes to frustrate a plan that tends to deprive a whole community of all that is valuable in life. Tea became a symbol of all that angered them about the monarchy. It signified oppression and domination. But while they were very angry about the new strictures, they still maintained their love for their brew, and it was time to improvise. Liberty tea is concrete evidence to me that the ritual of tea was as important as the tea itself. To what lengths did patriots go to replace their tea? There was Labrador tea made from a local shrub. Hyperion tea was made from raspberry leaves. Liberty tea could contain strawberry leaves, sassafras bark, berries, and other herbs. There were teas made of ribwort, sage, currant, loose strife. As was stated in the Dictionary of American Regional English, an imaginative variety of plants was tried in an effort to find a palatable substitute for China tea. I suspect the word palatable was a very important part of that sentence. And why? Why did they work so hard? Ritual. They clung to the familiar. In some ways, it wasn't about what was in their cup. It was about hospitality and comfort and home. Of course, the black market tea industry didn't emerge for no reason. John Hancock's uncle Thomas smuggled Dutch tea into the country to sell to British Army and Navy. In Liquid Jade, the story of tea from east to west, Beatrice Hoenegger writes that more than half of all the tea consumed w was being smuggled. I think many people hoped never to have to put Liberty Tea in their cup again. In the early to mid 1800s, Boston area's tea rituals and traditions changed. For years, they had taken their cues from the Dutch and the English. There was Delftware and porcelain, we then switched to the well-known silver sets with their silver teapots and spoons and caddy ladles, trivets and trays and urns, milk and sugar bowls. Tea became about free time during the workday, manners, dress-up clothes, delicate food, fine china, and silver tea service. Those later gave way to heavy clay pottery with dark brown paints and red and gold glazes, and late in the 1800s to creamware. But the 1840s saw a really interesting change, imports directly from China by clipper ship. Some of America's first millionaires made their fortunes from the China tea trade, including John Jacob Astor and Boston's Thomas H. Perkins. Another important player well known in these parts is Elias Haskett Derby. In the book, The Clipper Ships, ABC Whipple stated that by 1850, one-fifth of every household's good in Salem were from China. That was in no small part due to Derby and his success with his clipper ships. With that trade also brought Chinese laborers escaping poverty and new tea choices, styles, and tea wear. For example, as a, up here, in Salem a Chinese practice was adopted that was not picked up in many other locations. The tea leaves were steeped and strained, and often the tea liquor itself was thrown away, and the leaves were buttered and salted and eaten as a vegetable. Tea was part of everyday life. It was what people woke up with. It was an afternoon break. It was an evening relaxant. People in Boston, one writer noted in 1870, take a great deal of tea in the morning, have dinner at 2 o'clock, and about 5 o'clock take more tea, some wine, Madeira, and punch. It was seen as an excuse for a social gathering, large or small, formal or informal. Tea made its way out of homes and into the department stores in the late 1800s. Tea rooms and shops were common, but certainly considered a place for the more affluent. 
tea rooms like the one pictured here, which was at Hancock Tavern on Corn Court here in Boston. And eateries became popular again. And in the early 20th century, going for afternoon tea at a hotel became the thing. As cars became more common, tea rooms began to pop up in the countryside, giving tourists a place to take their tea. Tea became about an experience, going out to be seen and to socialize while shopping. They were a place to relax and have fun, and they were primarily for women, as women were not allowed in many of the private dining rooms, uh, public dining rooms, so tea rooms were the domain of women. And so, what can we say about Boston's rituals yesterday and today? First, we ask, what is a ritual? It's a series of actions or behaviors that regularly and variably are followed by someone. What were the keys of Boston's various tea rituals? I think first we need to recognize that these rituals were not static over time. They adapted to meet the tone and the culture of the time, the resources available, the communities and the people. I think what is truly important is to look at what the key components were that guided the developments of these rituals. The rituals. Polite company, spending time in conversation with friends and neighbors. Sustenance and refreshment. As now, food was an important way to socialize and tea was part of that. A boost to get through a long day ahead. Then as now, the caffeine, and as even Shen Nung recognized more than 4,000 years ago, the stimulating quality was valued. Pursuing healthier habits, whether as medicine or replacing alcohol or unsafe water, or today replacing sugary drinks, it's been seen as a healthy alternative. Shared experiences and togetherness, the sense of camaraderie and comfort. So what are Boston's tea rituals today? There are moments when I bemoan the lack of tea culture here in Boston. That comes from jealousy of watching new spots open up in cities like San Francisco and New York. It comes from the challenge of finding correctly steeped premium tea when I'm out and about. But then I step back and I remember the things that are wonderful about Boston's tea culture. We have the classics, beautiful hotel tea. That's my middle daughter when she was three and a half having her first tea at Park Plaza before they moved away from tea. But now they had one of the nation's first tea sommeliers, and she's now at La She's here in the city still, Cynthia Gold. There's still the ritual of getting dressed up to go to tea, the Four Seasons, or the Taj, or the Boston Harbor Hotel, or the Langham. We have purely Bostonian rituals, combining our love of tea and learning. Tea at the Boston Public Library, or at the Athenaeum. There's tea that reflects our city's different cultures and communities. The beauty of chai at our Indian restaurants, oolongs in Chinatown, matcha making its way into cafes and coffee shops. Boston's Irish community still favors their builder's tea so strong it can be walked upon. There's even a real Japanese tea house nestled in the back of a, town, of a brownstone here in the Back Bay where visitors can, visitors can experience a true Japanese tea ceremony using Japanese teaware that's hundreds of years old. Well, I have to say the first time I went, as I sat holding the cup and the person running the ceremony said, that cup is a thousand years old and it was carried by raft across a river from Japan. I did say my heart fluttered a little, but it's an amazing experience and we're fortunate to have it here in Boston. And I would be remiss not to mention another important tea spot in our city, taking tea at Abbott Gale's Tea Room at the Boston Tea Party Ships a truly American chance to revel in the idea of having a cup of tea overlooking Boston Harbor at the site of our very original tea party. So why do I think this is important? Why do we consider ritual at all? And this is where the truest part of my love for tea is. While I continue to be fascinated by the technical components of tea, how it's made, its origins, the production techniques, my true passion is the, for the opportunities that tea provides us, the ritual. I often say that I appreciate the fact that tea makes us slow down. You can't make the water boil faster. You can't make the leaves release their flavors quicker. We have to wait calmly and patiently. There is intention and mindfulness. So each time we sit down with a friend to have a cup of tea at home, 
we reinforce those ideas of refreshment, shared experiences, and togetherness. When we dress up for afternoon tea with children or grandchildren, we hearken back to women in their finest carrying their teaware in their purse for a polite exchange with friends and neighbors. And what are your rituals? Is it the kettle you use each time to heat up your water? Perhaps there's a particular cup that you use or a type of tea you can't live without. You may use the same kind of sugar or a special spoon. You might sit in the same seat each time or there may be a certain friend who is your favorite tea companion. As for my own rituals, like Boston's, they continue to evolve and change, but are important for creating a sense of comfort and predictability. Even though thoughts of my largely tea-less childhood still includes rituals of those days, as I wrote in the introduction to a tea reader, no matter how far I travel from my childhood days, the emotions evoked by those early tea memories become vis remain visceral. The memory of hot, milky tea is one of warm's, mom's comfort, warm blankets, and listening to my favorite books being read to me. Remembering glass jars of sun tea gives way to thoughts of blue sky, newly cut grass, and running barefoot. The emotions I feel about these moments make them as important as other more elegant tea experiences. Tea is not simply something you drink, but it provides quiet moments for making important decisions, a catalyst for conversations, and the energy we sometimes need to operate in our lives. I encourage you all to think about your own tea rituals next time you sit down to enjoy a cup of tea. Be mindful and aware of how these movements, movements and traditions are part of your enjoyment. Consider the fact that as you steep those leaves and pour that cup, you are part of a long, long history. You are creating your own ritual that adds to the beautiful patchwork that makes up Boston's rich tea history. Thank you. Do you get upset when people go out and it's not a fancy place and you get handed the tea, the tea with the hot steaming water, not boiling water, <laughs> and the tea bag on the other side? That is a really good question. Do I get upset? Um, I am often very disappointed by tea when I go out. Actually, a lot of times my friends make fun of me because I order coffee because I often feel like the tea isn't what I hope it will be. Um, yes, I I'm, I'm, was speaking with Erica earlier and uh, I was friends with the late John Harney of Harney and & Sons and this is a conversation I think we had probably every six months for about 10 years was um, why we can't get restaurants and hotels to do tea correctly. But the flip side of that, the ritual piece, is if I'm at a friend's house, I always say no matter how you serve the tea, I am grateful to have it and I am happy to share that experience with you. Are you, are you some people leave the tea bag in the tea. Is that? I've never seen that before I came to Boston. <laughs> where were you coming from? Connecticut. From Connecticut. Um, you mean when you're served tea in a restaurant? Or even at home? Well, I think some cases it's uh, deference to not knowing how strong you'll want your tea. Um, other times I think people are not used to serving tea, don't know how to steep tea or how long to steep tea. Are there certain pots that you like? Like I've heard that the Rockingham pot is the best because when you pour the water in it swirls the loose tea leaves around. That's a good question. Teaware. I find teaware, teapots and the like, to be a really personal thing. Um, I have friends who will only do tea in the Chinese terracotta pots, they're called yixing, and they have a different pot for different types, types of tea because the clay actually absorbs the flavors of the tea. And so they have their dark oolong pot and their light oolong pot and their black tea. Other people swear by bone china because that's what they grew up with and that's the, the porcelain reminds them of tea. Um, there's the cast iron, which some people love because it stays warm, and some don't love because it can scorch the tea if you're not careful with temperature. So um, I must confess that I have a lot of different teapots at my house. Um, and then honestly, most of the time, I, use a, I have stainless steel infusers that sit in my cup, and I just do a single cup. Um, 
partly because my kids are 10, 8, and 5, and I rarely get through a teapot without it being ice cold by the time I'm done. So, I'm curious about, um, you know, I'm thinking about myself being a tea drinker, and I think of the rituals of tea drinking, but I know there's lots of people who drink coffee and think of that as a very ritual process as well. And then I'm thinking the fact that we have right next door here now on Milk Street a Japanese coffee shop, which definitely seems to be focused on a very kind of ritual, ritualistic kind of preparation of different types of specialty cups of coffee, as well as then they have the matcha drink that they do as well there. But I noticed not other teas. And I was just curious if you, in your travels through tea rituals and how they've developed, if you have also kind of looked at how they might, the, the development of those tea rituals might have intersected with or somehow related to the development of coffee rituals? That's a really good question. Um, I think when I look again at ritual at its core, I, I see it really as, um, it's again, it's that sense of doing things in a, in a way that uh, brings additional comfort because it's predictable, it feels, it, it brings memories. Um, and I think that is not surprising to me that we would see that in other, with other beverages like a coffee or a hot chocolate or you know, whatever that uh, drink is. I think the coffee question is really interesting because tea, Tea is finding its way here in America in terms of people really learning about the different types of tea, the origins, the styles. Um, coffee has been in no small part due to a very large um, coffee chain, starting with Star, um, become extremely well known and origin was kind of pushed from the beginning is where did this come from and, and what's unique about where that came from. I think people are slowly learning that about tea. Um, but then the flip side is we're seeing in places like India uh, coffee starting to take hold and the older generations bemoaning the fact that the younger generations only want to drink coffee. So I think you know those intersections and those, those plays around ritual I think we'll see more and more of that. Do you ever use a cozy? Um, I do not use a tea cozy. Um, only because uh, I tend to leave my tea, my leaves in the pot, and so I use loose leaf tea, and the cozy keeps the it almost too warm and the leaves steep too long. So I tend not to, but uh, maybe that would solve my problem with my tea getting um, cold. <laughs> I always tend to drink coffee, say in the morning, or when I want to relax, I go to tea. Mm -hmm. Coffee just seems a faster drink to me. You're right, and, and you know what, there's actually science behind that because um, tea actually contains some components that cause, first of all, um, tea leaves actually, an individual leaf actually has more caffeine per weight than coffee. However, it is extracted slowly into the water and there are compounds in it that change the way our bodies our bodies react to that and it actually causes the caffeine to release more slowly in your system. So you're getting the caffeine but it's kind of a more gradual process than with coffee when you kind of get hit with it all at once. All right. well, thank you so much Katrina. Thank you. No more shall my teacup so generous be in filling the cups with this pernicious tea, for I'll fill it with water and drink out the same before I lose liberty, that dearest name.